thank you so much for being here. Apparently I gave Hattie the wrong link, so hence we started a little bit late. Apologies for that, but good to see you all here. This is the first interview I've done in a couple of weeks, I think, maybe more. So it's good to be back. Looking forward to talking to Hattie about her practice. Um, we are recording. Yep. So usual process. We'll take about an hour together. I'll interview Hattie for somewhere between 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll do some open Q&A at the end for anything that comes up for you guys. Um, so... Uh, I always love these interviews where I'm coming to it relatively blank. I know I've, I've known Hattie for a number of years, but I don't specifically know her business too well or what she does. I, I kind of broadly know, but I don't know how she gets her clients or what her ambitions are with it. So I always enjoy coming to these kind of interviews just with a completely blank slate. So um, first of all, let me introduce Hattie. Hattie is the founder, coach, CEO, Uber, Uber person of uh, Find Your True Voice. So Hattie, do you want to jump in and just introduce yourself more effectively than I've just done and just give us a bit of steer on who you are? Yeah, I can't promise I'll do it more effectively than you've done it. Um, <laughs> like with everybody, I think it, when you're sort of asked who you are and what you do, you're kind of like, oh yeah, I need to I need to have this down. Catherine Watkin, who has helped me with this, would, would be disappointed in what I'm probably about to say. Um, yeah, so I'm Hattie Volker and I started uh, Find Your True Voice well, when I when I did my training with Animas, which was in 2015, so seven years ago, which is really surprising, um, I started Find Your True Voice because when I retrained as a coach, because I used to be a barrister um, and I spent 10 years being, being a lawyer, the, the coal face, um, and then I retrained as a life coach. And while I was doing that, I was working for an international summer music school for singers. And as I watched the singers, I kind of realized that it wasn't always the people with the best voices who were the best performers and who connected with the audience best. And I was like, hold on, I think life coaching techniques could help them with this. And I'm a singer and I'd had my own crisis with my voice. Um, and so I started to, as practice clients in the very early days, work with singers to get them to have a different mindset to see if that would change how they sang. Um, and I noticed it was actually the wonderful Ruth, um, who um, works for Animas now, who coached me in our early days. It was one of our practice sessions together. And she coached me around my singing. And at one point she said, I thought you enjoyed singing. Because what we'd realized was that I was beating myself up all the time when I was singing and how much that that then affected how I produced my voice. So then I set up Find Your True Voice and I worked with singers in a more sort of determined way and started to work out what were the general trends going on for singers. And I think the truth is that singers feel, I think most people feel when they sing really quite vulnerable. You know, if I were to ask any one of you now, or you were to ask me now, just why don't you sing? Be like, oh crikey, yeah. Um, and I think there's, when we sing, I think we reveal part of our soul to put that sort of, I think we feel like we reveal part of our soul, whether you believe that sort of stuff or not, I happen to. And that makes us feel really vulnerable. So then it started me down the road of working with people around their vulnerabilities and how to show up in a space and kind of own that space and go, this is me. Um, and not hide from your vulnerabilities, but start to use them as your superpowers uh, because that's what makes us human. And so that's really how my business progressed. And then I developed, as so many coaches do, an online course because I realized the one-to-one -one work I was doing wasn't enough, wasn't reaching enough people for me. So I developed a program called the Fearless Performer Program, which is an eight module online program, which essentially teaches people what Animas taught me. Sorry, Nick, um, but a little twist on it. It's very different. It's very much focused on performing, but little sort of life coaching tools to help them get a different perspective on themselves, a different perspective on what they're doing and a different perspective on their audience to stand on stage and be able to go, yeah, this is me. And so essentially in not so short a nutshell, that's <laughs> kind of what I do. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's really interesting because I, one of the things that happens, I, I, if I can share personally, one of the things that happens for me, I'm not a singer at all, but when I do my lectures, for instance, or if I used to do my introduction to transformative coaching session, which was a day long kind of free workshop, I would get home, I feel really weird, like it wasn't a good feeling. 
I felt like you said about your soul and I would feel like I had depleted myself by giving too much of myself away. And even, even now I still do. If I'm going to be doing a lecture this evening on the phenomenological stance and transformative coaching, I know that an hour later I'm going to feel somehow cheapened by that, which is a really weird thing to say, isn't it? But it's like somehow I've revealed too much of myself or I've exposed too much. And so it's not obviously just singing. I'm kind of curious whether this is something that you're now finding you're taking to a wider audience or is it still much very much about that singer that performer like where, where how do you see this kind of sitting now in the market so yeah I mean I coach business people I coach all sorts of different people anybody who feels like they put themselves on display and put themselves out there because fundamentally what I realized the reason I like working with singers is because it takes what's going on for somebody in their normal life you put them on stage and it's like they go under a magnifying glass and all their insecurities are kind of exacerbated and they become larger. So it's actually easier to coach somebody around that. Um, and I think that idea that you're depleted, yeah, it's it's how, how you approach that. Because actually, if you flip it and start looking at what the audience are getting from this. So I was lucky enough, I came to one of the discovery days that you ran in, it must have been 2015. Um, and if you think what I took away from that day was amazing, you know, I went along going, okay, I'll see what this life coaching thing is, is, you know, I kind of like the way you were talking. I'm a philosopher. You're a philosopher. It spoke to me. And then I came away from the day going, wow, that's amazing. And I only did that because you revealed your soul and we don't connect with um, this very popular word of inauthentic or authentic, you know, but we don't connect with people who've got a mask on. We just, you can't reach them. It's the same as in coaching. And you say, where else does this take me? And, you know, I'm a mentor and a supervisor now. And the same stuff that goes on for singers goes on for coaches when they're sitting in the seat opposite their client. You know, how much of myself do I bring to this? How much am I, and it's, it's all about, for me, it's not how much of yourself do you bring, it's about what your agenda is. Because you can't help but bring yourself. You're sitting there, you bring your reactions, they have their mirror neuron responses to you. You, you, you can't help your eyebrow slightly raising possibly. Um, just the energy in the room is there, your thoughts you bring, and then they respond to your thoughts before you've even spoken to them uh, about them. And you might not even say anything about your thoughts, but your whole demeanor will show your thoughts. So you're there in the space. And just like with a performer, it's about what your agenda is. And if your agenda is to feed the audience, to deliver this amazing message that you have to deliver, whether that's in a song or, you know, I've got this amazing course, this is what I teach you, I teach you how to do this. Um, and you're focusing on the message and what your audience will take away from it. And I think mindfulness comes into this as well and being well aware of what is going on for you internally. And you bring those three awarenesses together then you create this amazing space where um, the space becomes something of its own. You're creating this, you know, Dan Siegel would talk about the we of it. I can't stand that word, but I understand what he means by it. The space develops its own personality and it's by revealing your soul that you touch other people's soul. And that's when something truly amazing happens, both in the coaching space, in a business space, and when you go and see the most amazing performance, it's when you come away going, wow. But that requires people to be brave mm. enough to show their soul. Yeah. The, the, the context of this interview, Hattie, is, is the business side of, of coaching. And so I want to make sure we touch on that. But I'm also conscious that in a way, we're also talking on, uh, touching on, sorry, the, you know, what coaches face, which is their own internal sense of incongruence or fear of, fear of being seen and so on and at the same time we're also I feel um touching on the issue of when you have a niche let's call it a niche when you have a, a specialist area how do you ensure do you have to ensure it's just coaching or do you bring in a blend of different approaches to get the outcomes that you stand for so given that we've got these three threads is it okay if we start with that last one which is because it's something I notice a lot of coaches like struggle with which is well I learned these coaching skills which are about not giving advice and so on 
but I want to develop this specialist area where I have some expertise. So how do you how do you balance that expert versus facilitator status? Do you or are you purely one or the other? Like, what's your approach to all of that stuff? I think, again, it comes back to this idea of awareness and agenda. You know, what is it I'm actually wanting to achieve in this space right now? So I have at the moment, I have two um, things I run for for performance. So I have the Fearless Performer program and that's very much I'm in the teaching mode there. But I bring my coaching skills to it. And so when people you know, ask a question, I'll go, oh, tell me what you think about that. How do you feel right now? What's going on for you? And I'll bring those sort of questions to it. But essentially, I know I'm in teacher mode there. So I'm in a teacher drawing on my coaching skills. I then have this thing called the Courageous Club, um, where we have um, trainings, we have workshops, and we also have group coaching. And in that group coaching space, I'm much more of a coach that occasionally will bring some of the knowledge I have and put it in the space with that detachment, you know, unattached to what people take from it. And then if you go into my one-to-one coaching, that I go into pure coaching because there, I mean, there's real joy in that. Was there a journey for you to find your way to that mix? Because I noticed a few comments on the lounge recently asking, like, I've got this specialism and I'm not sure when do I coach, when do I do other stuff? And is that OK? Did you have to go through a journey of figuring that out or did you always know there was a sort of a blended approach to the way you work? Very definitely a journey. Very. Because I think like everybody, you know, you start to learn um about coaching and as Marcus Stone would say you start feeling like you have this superpower and you go out and you apply this superpower and you forget to ask permission to coach and people get offended and you're going ah hold on this was amazing superpower what's going on here and you go so you go through your own learning to be a coach journey and I think that's the first journey Um, and I think I probably I got really excited about what I'd learned and I wanted to teach that um, in very much in the context of performing. So I then probably muddled the two too much. And it was actually, I think the next stage of my journey was actually a couple of years ago, um, because I think it is coming up to a couple of years ago when I did the supervision course with you. Um, And that really heightened my self-supervisor. And that idea of, oh okay so I'm teaching here do I want to be teaching and then I I'm at the moment I've got my application in for PCC and that again heightened my awareness because that is absolutely pure coaching you know you're really getting to the nitty-gritty and I would listen to my recordings going yeah why did I ask that question and start to to pick apart what was that question about why did I say, "Uh aha, there? What was I doing there? Hold on, I can hear myself pushing here. And it was real, I think it's the, you never stop learning as a coach. And the moment you stop learning as a coach, you become a worse coach because there's no end to it because we change, you know, every seven years, almost every cell in our body changes and our neural pathways change. So our personalities change and what we do, what we learn actually changes how we show up in the world. And I think our coaching doesn't necessarily get better, but it changes. And what I did two years ago will be different to what I do now, will be different from what I do in two years time. For me that I take a very philosophical approach. There is no ultimate, but it's about increasing my awareness. And I think that's, that is the key to coaching, it's the key to performing. It's being more aware of what exactly you're doing in, in the space so that you set the agenda and you're not just doing stuff because you do it. You go, you're more deliberate about what am I doing in this space and what is yeah. the reason? Is it my agenda or their agenda? Yeah, that makes sense. It's funny, I remember you, you reminded me of something when I first listened to myself um on a recording because I, I don't know if you remember years ago I did a whole series of coaching contracts where I recorded them and then people could listen to them and the client knew that of course but I remember listening back to them thinking well, why did I ask that or, or what was going on for me and then I realized that the amazing thing about coaching is so much of what's in coaching is is in your head and in their head it's not what's spoken it's what Clutterbuck calls you know the seven conversations 
um, you know, the internal conversation than the external. And you realize that when you listen to a recording, you've only got the external. And it's not a very good representation of actually what's happening internally for each of you, but also emotionally between you. You know, it, it somehow misses that. It's really interesting how a recording, anyway, that's a complete side note, but you just made me think of it. Um, so let me, if I may, come back to the, a more prosaic kind of issue, which is the business. Of, but it's not prosaic for me, but it might be for you, which is like, how do you get clients and that sort of stuff? So um, when we think about your business today, rather than when you first started it, what's your, what's the basic structure of it? How do you, how do you get clients? What's the, you know, how does it kind of work at an operational level? So um, I was talking about this with somebody yesterday um, and she was like, what plan do you have? And I'm like, I'm really not very good at planning. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very good at planning. And when I get too serious about planning, actually my business suffers because what mostly what I do is I go where I enjoy. I go what feeds me and what, what makes it fun because I'm a great believer if everything's driven by fun, you work harder, you are more effective and the people you work with will pick up on that sense of enjoyment and fun and everything will be better for them. So we actually achieve more and do it better when we are enjoying it. And so um, I think there is a the large amount of um, social media in what I do. Um, I do a five day challenge um, once or twice a year. I, I just did a live event, which I had people come and I got people through um, social media posting stuff. Uh, the five day challenge made a big made a big difference to my audience um, the first time I ran it. Facebook's got a bit tighter on the advertising. I don't get so many people through there. It's changed completely. But it's really, I think, and I said this to um, the person I was speaking to yesterday, it's going to the places you know. Um, and, and so when I was doing this first, I was working with the singers. So those were the people I called on and I pulled in to my coaching world. It was good because I wanted to coach them. So I think it's harder if the, your current world isn't the people you want to coach. But I very much went to the people I, I knew and it's speaking their language. So going on social media and speaking a language that speaks to your ideal client. And this is very Catherine Watkin because, you know, I got to know Catherine through Animas. And she's like, if you decide who your ideal client is, and then you just speak to them, your message will call whoever that speaks to. And it will, you know, I get business people coming and saying, I want what you do. Um, even though I, I definitely put myself out there as working with singers, because fundamentally, my message becomes much clearer when I'm just speaking to one person. And so that's essentially where I get my clients. I get a certain amount, obviously, through working with, with um, Animus, people, uh, see me and they say well, I want you to be my supervisor or I want you to be my coach but in the main actually it has been social media that's really interesting I because I, I only added social media to my best approaches to get clients recently it went from snap to snaps with us being the social media part the other s being speaking of course um so but I still struggle with it. Like, I can't imagine how I would do it in some ways. Like, I like social media for content dissemination, but I don't, I'm not very strategic on client acquisition through it. So is it a case of you just using it as a content distribution network and then you kind of hope that out of that will come the clients? Or do you have a way to actually kind of strategically get the client from that? Um, I'm, I'm not very good with strategy. I'm, I'm more scattergun than strategy. Um, but I think if I were to pin it down, if I look now back with hindsight and say, OK, well, how did this client get to me? It's, it's back to the old adage of no like and trust. Yeah. It's I put myself out there. I'm because of what I teach when I'm out and I'm talking like I am now. This is me. You know, I will make mistakes and I will make mistakes in public um, and go, I did, and it's okay. Hmm. Um, because that's part of who I am and, and what I teach. But I think people get to know me. So when I did my live event, I had people turn up and they greeted me like long lost friends. And I was standing there going, yeah, hi, I really don't know who you are. Um, but you know, <laughs> I don't say- You weren't saying that. 
Um, yeah, yeah. No, obviously, remind me who you are because you know you know me really well. But I don't. I only get to see you in that size box. So remind me who you are. Um, and it was just amazing how well people thought they knew me, and they probably do because what you see is what you get with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I realized that then they, because it's so hard to buy an online course out there, but if you're buying from somebody you feel you know, and you feel you can trust, then it takes that edge off. Um, and then, you know, I do workshops where people can come and experience like you in your discovery sessions, mm-hmm. where people get to come and feel what it's like. To, to understand this. Yeah. And it, it's that process that, you know, some, some people might take three or four years to actually get to the point where they come and do some work with me. Other people will meet me, go, yeah, fine, done, and pay for my full private mentoring, yeah. you know, thousands of pounds. Um, and some people will take four years to spend the very small amount to come and do mm. my, my online course. And it's like- And ask for a refund. <laughs> Yes, not yet, not yet, but <laughs> I know it will happen at some point. So one of the things I noticed from talking to a lot of coaches over the years is they think they haven't got a strategy and they say I'm not very strategic and then you unpick it and they've got a strategy. So you've got a strategy, but I'd like to try to get a little bit clearer on it. So your strategy is social media and essentially connection, let's call it that, and then people finding you through resonance. Um, let me, let me see if I can figure out, because because when I approach this, I kind of do it much more strategically. Like I'm going to have this many Google ads feeding this many, you know, blah, 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 and it all goes through and job done. I, or at least I used to do that. But it doesn't sound like that's your approach. So you've got, broadly speaking, you're saying you attract people to some social, through social media to something, and that something creates connection, and that connection ultimately potentially leads to a client. So what is that something? You've got the social media bit, and you say it feeds to an event, and you had Facebook ads. So is this like a big, is it a webinar? Is it like a big a multi-day summit? What do you, what do you do? What's this event? What is this thing? Um, so, well, it started with my five-day challenge. Um, and I, you know, five-day challenges were the big thing. And I think it was Catherine suggested it. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give it a go. Not knowing, again, um, not being strategic ahead of time, or maybe I'm just not aware of my own strategy. Uh, I thought, okay, I'll do it. And so I set it all up, um, designed the five day challenge in the fact that how I was going to advertise it, and then got to about three days before and go, went, okay, so what's the content going to be? <laughs> um, I'm going to need to have some content. And essentially the content turned out to be exactly what I've been talking about now. You know, the idea of connecting with your material, connecting and re-perspectiving your audience and reconnecting with yourself or connecting with yourself and giving them tiny little tasks that help them do that. And then getting them to experience the impact doing that has on their thinking. So, and in whatever event I do, so I then follow it up and I have a webinar or an online workshop where I do the same thing, um, except that's much more of a teaching space but get them to sort of explore what's going on for them. And a big part of it is them realizing they're not alone. So one of the biggest parts of both of them, as I realized with hindsight, is the idea uh, that other people think the same things as they do. Because once they realize that other people think the same things as they do, they start believing that it might be possible for it to change because they're not alone. It's not them that is damaged in some way or broken or wrong. And I think with all of that, you talk about connection. I think that is absolutely the key for everything I do. And it's not just connection with me, it's connection with other people. And that goes right through. So to the people in the Courageous Club, one of the things they like most about the Courageous Club is they get there and they'll say, to somebody else, hold on, are you in my head? Because you're saying exactly what I'm thinking right now. And as soon as you get people doing that, you give them hope that they can change things. And that fundamentally is what I believe, you know, having been taught by you. It's fascinating because that's actually the fourth stage of um, Mesereau's 10 stages of transformative learning is recognizing that other people have struggled with the same challenge because I think it gives the permission and the allowance to say, well, all right, then other people have gone through it or are going through it. How do I navigate it too? 
So, so very briefly, like I, I'm a bit of obsessed about getting granular sometimes so that people on this call can go, well, all right, that kind of made sense, but specifically how? So what are they doing? Are they joining a Facebook group? Are they joining a Facebook page? Are they, where are they going to get these five, this five day challenge? So with the five, so I have a Facebook group um, called the Fearless Performer, but for the five day challenge, I set up a different group. Mm -hmm. um, and they have to join the group in order to get the videos. The videos are only in the group, which means you bring them into the space where they have to connect. Um, so I'm, I don't send out the, the videos by email because mm -hmm. then they could sit in their own little world and do it. And right. the point is for them to be able to hear and connect. And as yeah. you say, you know, understand other people have been through this. So and that just lasts for the period, you know, maybe a week maybe right. eight days and then I close it down oh. um, and inv invite them to join my free group that's nice. um, yeah so that and that's how that works and the the for the webinar um it's a zoom meeting yeah. um and they get a, an invitation and then they have to sign up and join so I get their email at least and they can sit listening to having my emails come out and listening to what I say what I say yes. about things I really like that idea of the time limited group. I've not heard of that before. I don't know if that's a common practice in the sort of five day challenge world or something, but I like it because it's got this kind of sense of scarcity to it, doesn't it? It's like you're either in it now or you're not at all. And it's going to, it's almost like a mission impossible. It's going to self destruct after five days or whatever. How long does the group last for? You've got the five day challenge. Does it kind of have a bit of a lag period afterwards or not? So, a couple of days. So, I'll do Monday oh. to Friday and then I'll probably close it down on the Sunday. Wow. Oh, and how many people typically would be part of that group? It varies. And will this change? So the first time I did it, um, I I did a few Facebook ads and I was expecting maybe 20 or 30 people because nobody mm. knows me. And I had 180 people sign up oh. and, it's like, and I switched down the ads going, oh, I don't know if I can yeah. run a group with 180 yeah. people in it. Um, and then the second time, I think it was 300. And then the third time it was 500. But then the fourth time I ran it, I went back down to 180 um because facebook had changed the way it did the ads so it's was that because it was more expensive to do the ads or what, what was the difference well i think they didn't there was a change with ios that where yeah. it wasn't reaching as many people mm. um but literally i just didn't get as many i did exactly the same ads and got a completely different response that's really fascinating i had i mean that's a really good little business model i, I love it when the coaches say i'm not strategic and then they have this amazing plan so i mean like how much would it cost you to get 500 people into a group what, what were you spending um, on the ads? I think, uh, well, I, I, I think originally um, it was costing me, I think I spent about £500. I was getting yeah. 69p conversions and things. Yeah. Um, but then towards the end, I was spending about 2000 to wow. try and get that and only getting 180 So the oh. business model isn't working as well. And I'm looking at a completely yeah. different way of doing it now. Yeah. Um, but, but the principle of getting people into the five-day challenge, that works. And the same, I mean, and actually getting people live so I did the live so my conversion might have been about 10 percent for the five-day challenge but my conversion when I did a live event was 60 percent conversion to what to, to the buying the course. course yeah and 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 the the I'm sorry I'm sort of going into lots of detail but I hope that's interesting for people listening so the people that went to the webinar did they come from the five-day group so no um okay so, so there are three things. There's the five day challenge, there's the webinar, and then there was the live event that I did. Yeah. Um, people who are in the five day challenge can come to the webinar. Other people come to the webinar and the webinar had a similar conversion rate. rate. And in fact, I didn't convert anyone from the webinar this time around because I did the live event and then the webinar instead of the five day challenge. Right. Um, but now being aware that I get a 60 percent conversion rate in the in the live event yeah. it's kind of like okay so I think that's where I'm going to go next time how yeah. many people can get, can I get into this live event yeah yeah wow interesting because to my mind the five-day challenge is a great funnel into the live event isn't it ultimately potentially at least I hadn't thought of that yeah like that idea yeah 100 yeah, percent it is because that's free uh, and it's just going to create a great avenue lovely I love I love this conversation thanks Hattie I really enjoyed um hearing how you've broken this down um let's talk about one more thing and then i'm going to open up to the to the attendees to, to ask anything they want to which is i'm kind of curious about your take on let's let's switch it away from the business marketing side now and we'll talk about this idea of finding your voice as it pertains to a coach finding their voice as a supervisor presumably you're working with coaches and this is something that you notice coming up imposter syndrome what's my message how do i you know, become authentic. What's your take on what you're seeing for either new coaches or coaches that are kind of just never quite found 
that thing? Like what's what's your advice or your thoughts on how they can navigate that? So fundamentally, I think it comes back to the one of the most fundamental principles of coaching, which is curiosity. Um, and as with any sort, because as with any sort of performing, because coaching is a sort of performance. You're sitting there. Um, and I think a performance is any situation in which we fear that we're going to be judged. And the truth is, you will be. You know, I say to my performers, I'm not going to tell you you're not going to be judged because we are humans. And that is part of the human, it's part of our survival mechanism. We judge, we can't take in all the information. So you will be judged. But it's also the realization that we're not going to be judged by our standards. And, and then it starts, I think, because as soon as we go into that internal thing of questioning ourselves, doubting ourselves, overthinking, um, wondering what the next right question is. And I hear that a lot, you know, I don't know what the right question is. Well, as far as I'm concerned, there is no right question, but there are also no wrong questions because every question brings information. Even if a question falls flat, ooh, ooh, that was interesting. I thought that was gonna be really an interesting answer, but they've just, ooh, nothing came of that. And then you've got more information. If you ask a question and it falls flat and you go, what did I do wrong? Ah, okay. Uh, and then you've suddenly gone inward and it, then it comes, you've lost your curiosity because instead of being curious about your client, you're seeking to protect yourself, to be better, and it triggers the imposter syndrome. And then the agenda flips from being about your client and how to serve them to you and how to be good enough. Um, and I suppose it's back to the Brené Brown concept of if we go on stage, go into the coaching space, and truly believe that we start as good enough. We're in the I'm okay, you're okay box firmly. Then it opens us up to be truly curious and truly serve our clients. And imposter syndrome becomes a distraction because whether you're good enough or not good enough is kind of irrelevant in this moment. It's about your your client and how best to serve them. And in the same way as when I get the, um, the performers to think about how to serve their audience, they can't think about how well or badly they're doing. In the coaching space, if we keep the agenda about curiosity, what's going on for our client, it's really hard to, for the imposter syndrome to creep in and stultify what's going on, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. It, it feels to me as I'm listening to you that there are two dimensions to this and maybe you you, you look at one dimension or maybe you look at both. So one is this kind of, how am I being in the moment? So my true voice right now, which is about curiosity and the client and all that kind of stuff. And that's the present moment. And then I kind of think of the true voice about who, who am I as a coach? You know, who do I want to be in the world? So more of a branding true voice, but it sounds like that's not your, am I right in thinking that's not where you place yourself or do you? Well, it was actually something you said in the supervision course, because I remember you saying, because Jung says there's no light without shadow. And you said, well, that's rubbish. There's no <laughs> shadow without something blocking the light. Right, um, right. And that um, a copywriter once told me that the etymology of genius is in a light. I think it, it's in a spirit, in a light, something like that. And for me, that was a real metaphor for coaching, because essentially what everyone has genius in them, because we all have an inner light without fail. And it's not about what our inner light is. It's about what's blocking our inner light. Mm. And if we, instead of focus on, keep asking ourselves, what's my inner light? What, what is it? What is it? What's my genius? Mm. Start looking at what is getting in the way of us just being who we are. Um, then actually our inner light reveals itself. We don't have to create it or develop it or identify it. It just blossoms and it, it's it's like this idea of being isn't an isn't really an active verb it's just kind of like we just have to be mm -hmm. so what's stopping people being and that relates as much again to the coaching space because our curiosity is what's blocking this person's light we believe you know that um 
that they are perfect as they are. Uh, they are perfect and good as they are. And we're just trying to reveal what that goodness is in the same way for a performer. If they let go of their fear and their worry and their overthinking, it relieves the, um, the physical tension. So that actually their voice comes out and they find their true voice or they are able to express their true voice. The mental tension disappears and they don't overthink and they lean into that. And, and the intellectual tension disappears as well they're not questioning everything they do and I think again it re it relates to any performance anywhere so can I try to get that clear uh, are you saying essentially let me put it in my words and see if it if this is correct that the coaches shouldn't try to find their true voice they should just be their true voice and that true voice will then be what defines them so rather than define their true voice they just be it so that might be writing what they want to write or coaching the way they want to coach. And that starts to shape the brand rather than saying, what's my brand? And then living the brand. Yeah, I, th I think essentially, yes, it's find out what is stopping you just being. Mm. What is the reason, you know, we are, what's the reason they're questioning? Um, not, it's not about finding certainty because so many people want to find certainty. But, you know, as a philosopher, mm. I don't believe certainty exists. I just don't and it's how do we live with so other? certain of that Hattie <laughs> <laughs> I said I don't believe <laughs> I'm not certain but my belief is um but yes well spotted um my belief is that certainty doesn't exist and that's how I live my life mm -hmm. and it's how do we live with that uncertainty and be okay with it mm -hmm. it's kind of similar to how do we live with our vulnerabilities and be okay with them and how do we sit with our uncertainty in the coaching space so that it's okay for our clients to sit with their uncertainty in the coaching space, you know, sit with the unknowing uh, because we are only just pinning our colors to the mask and going, this is what I believe. I don't know it's true. I just yeah. believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And um, by the way, just my own reputation, I'm, I'm sure I didn't call young rubbish. I probably just put a very diplomatic slant on it rather than say That's right. young rubbish. <laughs> I'm sure you did. I'm sorry. I'm probably misquoting you. <laughs> you paraphrased. <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much, Hattie. I'm, I'm going to ask you where people can find out about you, but then I'm going to go to Q&A. So where, if somebody wants to uh, find out more about you, where can they go? So my website, findyourtruevoice.co.uk, you won't find out about my supervision or my mentoring there because it really is a side gig for me. It's something mm. I absolutely love doing, but my core business is my coaching. And so that is where you'll find out about my coaching and my, my ethos and my philosophy on life. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hattie. Let me go to gallery screen now for myself. And so we've got 20 minutes for any questions, or reflections, anything at all that's going to be useful for you to ask Hattie at this point or to to get clarification or anything at all, who would like to jump in and just put your virtual hand up as normal? Yep, let's go to Tom. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, hi, Hattie. Uh, nice to see you again. You, you were running one of the RPGs uh, that I attended, I think, last week. Um, Something you've said today has really resonated, actually, with a conversation I was having this morning. Um, I'm thinking ahead to launching my website for TG Coaching, and I'm kind of playing with this idea at the moment with finding the balance between the messaging to the audience. Uh, and you've said something today which really caught my attention about speaker language, which speaks to your ideal client. Because I, I think what I'm trying to sort of find a balance with is um, obviously trying to get my authentic message across of, you know, what I believe and my philosophy and all that sort of thing, kind of my coaching philosophy. But then also I want to keep it open enough to resonate with as many people as possible, you know, from the business side in terms of building a business. Um, so my question is, uh, when you said hold your ideal client in mind, that, that, that's an idea that I haven't really thought about yet. Can, can, would you mind expanding on that a bit? Can you, can you expand on what that would mean? Well, I think it relates to something you've just said, this idea that you want to keep it broad. Totally get that. I resisted narrowing down because I can coach anyone. You know, anyone who wants to be coached by me, certainly in the early days, it was like literally anyone wants to be coached by me. 
I can coach you, it's fine. Um, so I really didn't want to narrow down my message. However, if you don't narrow it down, you're just another life coach. And life coaches these days, there are, there are lots of life coaches. Why should someone choose you? And it's about, you know, it's back to finding your true voice, about owning what your voice is and going, this is what I truly believe. And I want to coach you, whoever that is. And you can get really specific on it. I want it to be a, a 32 year old um, man who is, unmarried um, but has a uh, has a, a child from another for former relation whatever it is getting really specific because what it does is it means you get clarity to your message so instead of scattergunning which is what I spent a lot of my career doing you're going this is my message and instead of working out what you want to tell them you're you're working out what would help them what, what would serve them? So it, it becomes less about your message and more about, oh, what they, what they could hear is this, this would help them. So let me tell them this. And then it brings focus to your message because whilst you're trying to keep it broad, broad is unfocused. So I suppose that's what I'd say about that. If that does that help? Yeah, it really does. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Hattie. Appreciate it. Tom, was that in connection with when Hattie was talking about the fact she still speaks to performers primarily, but they'll, she'll, she'll get leaders who approach her saying, this work sounds like what I need as well. Is that is that the bit you're referring to? You know what? I can't remember what it was actually in context around. I can't remember what Hattie was talking about at the time. It was just, it, it jumped out on me. So I made a note yeah. of it in terms of hold your ideal client in mind. Yeah, great. Uh, if it's okay, Hattie, I'll pick up on that though, because that's what sprang to my mind. Was like I was kind of curious on this. It sounds like you still target, in inverted commas, very military term, but anyway, target um, uh, performers, and you get other kinds of people. And I'm just, I was kind of curious on that decision as to at what point, if ever, you go. Actually, this skill called find your true voice applies to more than just performers. How do I find a language that allows all of those people in and still feels specific and focused? But it's no longer just saying, are oh, you a singer? Because they're like, well, no, I'm not a singer. I'm a leader. But it still fits. Does that, does that make sense? I was kind of curious on when, at what point you expand, if ever. I, don't, I think occasionally I'll put the message out and say, you know, this also works for business people. This also mm. works for leaders. But I think um, it, it's really hard. I don't think there is a right point. Mm. Um, I think it's about feeling your way. And again, your subconscious knows so much more than your conscious mind. And I spent too many of my too many years of my life relying on my conscious mind to solve all the problems. And you know, we talk about gut feeling, but we all know gut feeling is really just our subconscious. It's actually the, the massive intellect that we have going on underneath the conscious mind. Well, that's how I view it. And if we allow ourselves to just tune in to what feels right, then often as not, we, we speak to the people who are there. So, you know, when I, I did um, before the pandemic, I did quite a lot of um, local networking. And in that way, I might throw out a phrase, you know, what I do also works for business people. And I had, in the main, actually, it was business men, more than women, um, would come and seek me out and do coaching with me because they wanted to be able to stand and, and own the stage and feel comfortable and confident just being themselves. Because for me, the big difference between, and this is a huge generalization, you know, but the, the women women tended to believe that everybody felt this way and there was no solution to it. The tendency was for men to feel like they were the only ones who felt this way and they had to sort it out. Uh, they believed everybody else felt confident. Obviously there's a crossover um, and I don't want to be gender specific here, but that was the tendency that I found. And, and so I think being clear on what your message is and what you do and what, and what is uh, what you can produce for people or what you have produced, you, you, no guarantees in this, means that you will get the sort of clients that you want to serve and that you enjoy serving and who are seeking you out 
because they like what you do. Mm. And that can be really, it, it creates this nice fulfilling cycle. But I think you just feel it out. Yeah. That'd be what exactly. I would say. Yeah, great. That's it's kind, of, kind of interesting reverse psychology perspective to it too, because you're like, oh, hold on. She does this for performers, but I'm a leader. I wonder if she'll take me. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I'm persuading yeah. her to, to, be, you know, to have me as a client. Kind of interesting. All right, guys, any, any further questions, reflections, thoughts for, for Hattie? Find your true voice. This is your chance to find your true voice in this session. And it's interesting you said about the, the reverse psychology. I think it's true because I think everybody, that, no, I think there are a large number of people who would like to be good performers. And the idea that I'm coming at this from, from a singer's perspective, that I can yeah. bring a little bit from left field, I yeah. think they find quite exciting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I agree. Reminds me of a conversation that Sophie, who's on the call here, had, uh, had with me um, a few months ago, Sophie, where we were talking about your two different parts of your business. And I said, you know, to my mind, the, the BDSM stuff you do makes you so unique in terms of what did you have to face and overcome in order to do that that most people would can't comprehend and that becomes a, a, a real superpower of your experience great all right guys well it looks like that's we're coming to the end in that case so Hattie all I can say is thank you so much that's an absolute pleasure I really really enjoyed it now I, I, lo I love diving into the nitty-gritty sometimes of the, how business works so thank you for sharing the kind of the process for how you fill your group and so on that's really interesting to me as a bit of a kind of nerd of that sorts of stuff but i also love the big picture so thanks very much indeed hattie and thanks guys for being here as always and i'll see you at the next interview see you soon thank you Bye, everyone thanks, thanks. Bye.